Well, hello everybody. I think everybody should be able to hear us now. Yeah, can well, I, can, I can hear you well, so yeah. Hello everyone. <laughs> yeah. Hi everybody. So my name is Jonathan Reeves and this is Kisine. Introduce yourself, Kisine. Hi everyone, Kisine Chance, Industry Specialist here at VectorX UK. Um, been with VectorX a while now. Um, I've spoken to a few of you on the UK side. I can see the attendee list coming in. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much me. Um, and we have Jonathan Reeves, our architect, uh, evangelist specialist, as well as a VectorWorks partner in the UK with us today. That's going to be talking about all things VectorWorks um, Service Pack 3 releases and other elements as well. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think we've got some exciting new features to have a look at today for everybody. Um, but don't forget, you know, there's also a load of features in Vectorworks 2022. Um, maybe we're not focusing so too much on today's webinar that we, we talked about previously, but also really good reasons to have a look at. And uh, if you're not in Vectorworks 2022, get up to speed already. I agree. I mean, just one thing I wanted to mention before we do get started, we're, we're kind of waiting for a few more people to arrive. The attendees are looking great, though, rapidly going up. Um, I personally upgraded to 2022 straight away. I'm an early adopter. And personally, I find it to be extremely good, this release, in terms of quality and smoothness and the way it's, you know, been working on real projects with it right from the, the first day it came out, pretty much. So, you know, if you're one of those sort of uh, people or practices who haven't yet upgraded because you've kind of been waiting, perhaps, um, I would say that hopefully today might be a turning point where you, you know, Service Pack 3 is a good time to get on board, isn't it? No, I agree. I agree with that. There's a lot of been of, of Service Pack releases um, as well, so bug fixes, and it, I agree that this release has been a very stable release, so yeah. It is, it is. And <clears throat> I'm a Mac user, so um, I managed to get hold of my new MacBook M1 Pro back in November, which has been a revelation. And because Vectorworks is running natively on M1 Apple Silicon, um, it's been really, really nice to use. So I will tell you, if you're in that boat as well, thinking about maybe changing your Mac for whatever reason, wearing, you know, wondering how Vectorworks will work on uh, the new M1, it's very good. Very good. Couldn't be better. And um, even Twin Motion runs superbly on it as well. So it's exciting times. We've got the hardware, we've got the software coming together really well. And for PC users, of course, <laughs> <laughs> can't forget them. <laughs> very open as well. Well, what do you think? I think we've got a good level of attendees, Kasim. Shall we? Yeah. Yeah, I think we should start. We'll jump in. Um, we've got some pre-recorded material we've worked really hard on to get it nice and smooth for you guys. So I think what we'll do is, without any further ado, we'll jump into the introduction, and then we'll be talking about um, Twin Motion and the data link upgrade, and then we'll come on to uh, have a little pause actually for some questions and a poll. So you know we'll be back live in a minute, midway through, and then we'll come back with a couple more videos and some more Q and A at the end. As that sound like soon? Yeah, that sounds perfect. I'm excited for it. Excellent. Um, just to remind you, just to keep your questions in the question box, if you have any um, comments you want to put in the chat, chat the chat as well, feel free to do those. Yeah, we'll be able to answer some questions as we go during the chat, during the webinar. But I'm going to play this first video and then I'll play the next one immediately afterwards and we'll be back with some questions in a moment. See you shortly. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this VectorWix 2022 webinar. We're going to be looking at the new features of VectorWix Service Pack 3. Presented by myself, Jonathan Reeves, and industry specialist, Keysoon Chance. Now, today you're going to learn about the exciting new features of Vectorworks Service Pack 3. We're also going to show you how these new features can be used on your projects through some real-world examples. And you're going to develop your skills and knowledge of these new features, and much, much more besides. So just before we get started, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. I'm a practicing architect in the UK with over 20 years experience. I'm also a Vectorx reseller and partner for Vectorx and Twin Motion, and I've written a couple of books, Innovative Vectorx BIM and Revolutionize Your Rendering with Twin Motion. Now if you're interested, please come and have a look at my YouTube channel. I've got over 200 videos there and we've now reached 11,000 subscribers. I would also like to mention that I do online training globally we do have a great facility in Loughborough, 
and we're going to be getting this up and running this year as well. So we're going to be basically taking a look at three main areas of the new improvements in the new Vectorworks Service Pack 3. The first one is I'm going to talk about the new direct link uh, for Twin Motion and how real-time rendering integrated with your Vectorworks workflow can make a huge difference to the way you work. We're also going to be looking at the new Vectorworks Cloud Services and the new improvements to the Vectorworks Nomad mobile app as well. There's been some huge developments here, so we'll be going into these in a lot more detail. And then we'll also be talking about some of the important improvements in the Vectorworks Spotlight. Uh, the entertainment sector is a huge sector for Vectorworks, and there's some really nice improvements that Keysoon will run through with you to show you how Spotlight is the number one tool in the entertainment field in terms of design. So I really hope you enjoy this webinar. So let's get started with the first presentations. So Vectorwix has been able to export Datasmith and we've had the twin motion data link for a few versions now. Now there's some really nice improvements in the Datasmith direct link tool and this now has an auto sync option which immediately sends the changes across to Twinmotion from Vectorworks as you're working. So this streamlines the process as you're developing your designs. There's a few other big improvements as well. The Twinmotion Datasmith direct link can actually now export record data and IFC metadata. Now this does come across to Unreal Engine, but not currently in Twinmotion yet, but it will be supported I'm sure in the future. We can also basically specify where we want to store the direct links. So that's a real benefit in that you can choose a custom path on your server or Dropbox, for example. And finally, ambient point lights and spotlights will be exported in the Datasmith so that programs like Unreal Engine currently does support those, but hopefully Twinmotion will shortly in the future too. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the new Twinmotion Direct Datasmith uh, link and you can see that I've got a nice little project here for a contemporary home. Uh, it's one that I designed a little while ago for a client. And all I'm going to do to get this into Twinmotion is go down to my Unreal Datasmith Direct link here. I've actually got the shortcut here up on my basic tools and you can do this by editing the workspace if needed. So the first thing I'm going to do is just click into the settings and you notice that we've got low, medium, high, very high quality. Personally, I always export at medium quality unless I need to go to high if there's lots of curved geometry in my design. There isn't a huge amount in this one, so medium should be fine. Now you can use the default path or if you prefer, you can actually set a custom path, which is what I've done on this particular project. And you can see I've just put that into my webinar training folder here. So when I basically um, click OK in a second, it's going to export the model. There's just two other things I wanted to mention, and we can now export record data and IFC metadata. However, it does do bear in mind that Twinmotion doesn't yet support these. Um, I'm sure it will in the future, but it's just good to know that these are built into the export. So if we click onto this um, button here, direct link auto sync, just click for a second. It will take a few seconds to start the export process and then we should see a progress bar popping up. So what we're going to do is just pop into our Epic Launcher and let's launch our Twinmotion 2022. Now do remember, if you're a Vectorworks 2022 user, you've got to the end of the month, uh, March 31st, to claim your free Twinmotion license. So absolutely no reason why you shouldn't all grab the Twinmotion license. It's an amazing bit of software and for free, even better. Okay, so here we are in Twinmotion and the very first thing I'm gonna to need to do is just click import. You'll notice that I'm already on the data link tab. Okay, this is where you would normally import a standalone geometry, but you will notice that I actually have a couple of sources of a few different exports in there. Now the most recent one is this one here, the Swan Lodge. So let's click on this one and go for it. Just before I click OK, I'm going to just check the Keep Hierarchy. And this is one that I advise you keep so that the Vectorworks hierarchy of the model comes through. Otherwise, all objects in a single class or material will get collapsed into uh, one single material. Let's go ahead and click Update. 
Okay, so when we import the model, uh, we get the direct link, and we basically can now see over in the scene graph, the model is imported. So it may not necessarily appear, and you just need to click F in order to fit to find your model. And this looks really good. You know, it's coming exactly as I was hoping uh, from my sort of vector its model. See all the textures have come through really, really nicely. And the great thing with Twinmotion, the navigation's really, really kind of smooth and nice. And basically I can kind of just sort of slide the lighting around, change this in real time. Now, if I wanted to make a few kind of design changes, um, we can now go back to our model and do this very, very easily. So what I'm gonna do is just pop back and change these doors. I don't like the style of them perhaps. And let's just pop back into Vectorworks and have a look at this. So let's just go down to select these doors. I think what I'm gonna do is go into the settings and let's change this to uh, some Okay, so what we'll do, just pop into the settings. I'm gonna to go to the side lights to begin with and turn those off. So now I've just got two doors. And if we just go to general, we've got swing at the moment. Let's just change that to sliding. And I'm just gonna go for a multiple panel sliding door with three panels. So let's kind of see how that change looks, uh, both in the Betworks file, that looks cool. And you'll notice that very rapidly, it did the export down here. And if we just click back into Twinmotion, that change has already come through. So this is the biggest sort of difference. So, uh, the one of the real benefits of Twinmotion, as you can see, is the ability to navigate around in real time. Now, one thing that's really interesting is to pop open this statistics panel, and what this will do is give you some feedback on how good your graphics card is handling the Twinmotion software. And basically, as soon as you're in the green, you know that you're okay. It's got a thumbs up here. And you can see that my GPU is basically running this really, really well. Um, and that works extremely well on my MacBook Pro. If you do struggle a bit with the um, graphics card, then what you can do, just so you know, is pop into the preferences, go to quality settings, and if you just drop this down to medium or high settings, the screen will be pretty much as good, maybe not quite as good as ultra settings, but you're gonna get a higher frame rate. So I just thought I'd mention that little tip there. Okay, so what we're gonna do is do a bit more work on our project, both in Vectorworks and in Twinmotion. So I'm gonna basically go through and let's just drag some new glass onto that surface there. And I'm gonna kind of put some context in. So I'm just gonna get my trees and you'll notice with the twin motion trees, there's a very nice library of these available. If you do want to search them, you can search for some oak, for example. And that means that I can pull up some oak trees here. Now I can either drag them in one at a time into my project, or if I want to, I can select multiple items. Every single time I click, I'm basically gonna get one of those added to the scene. Um, so this is quite good if you're sort of, you know, not being uh, particularly sort of fastidious about which type of tree you're placing, but you just want to perhaps create a little bit of backdrop for your project. You can see how rapidly I've done that. Now, the good thing is all of these trees will stay when I do the updating from Vectorworks, as you'll see in a moment. And a great little tip here is to go to the new container just by right clicking. I would recommend you drag those trees into that container and then right click rename let's just call that trees of course and then that means that i can kind of group those up nicely and turn them on and off as required so i really recommend keeping your twin motion model twin motion model nice and organized as you work okay so here we are back in our project in vectorworks and let's just have a little look at the site so i've already got a site modeled up in my mod site layer here i just simply turn this back on and really just to um, sort of see a bit of context really about the project now. This is actually on the Grand Union Canal in Loughborough, very near where my, my offices are. So it's a nice sort of local project. And all I need to do is just check on the direct link and see if it's actually active. Um, so if I basically want to, I can just click to send those changes. But if I click back into Twinmotion, I didn't need to because they're already been put into the model. So basically now, if I do want to, I can basically add some new materials. Let's go to my grass and drag some different types of sort of grass on that surface there. I've also added a uh, nice water shader here. You can see that this water is absolutely amazing in twin motion with lots of motion itself. And there's different types of water that I can kind of drag onto the scene. I quite like this one. 
You can play around with things like the uh, depth and the waves. Um, you can sort of make the water a bit smoother, perhaps a bit less wavy as well. But look at that, it looks absolutely lovely. Okay, good. So let's click T for the texture tool. I'm going to sample this material here. I'm just going to drag that onto there as well. So now what I'm going to do is basically turn my trees back on and I can sort of see that I was a bit over ambitious with the trees. So what I can do is basically easily select those individually and just move them so they're not on the road there. And let's just sort of have a little tidy up in my project. Now, one of the really lovely things with Twin Motion is the fact you get a really nice library of content. So let's explore some of that for a moment and then we'll go back and maybe make a few more changes. So if I go to, for example, um, back to the libraries, I could go to vehicles, boats, and of course we could drag in a little boat. And you can see it's easy to position. I can actually position it up on the land here. I could even put it up on the wall, but let's position it down and it snaps to the surface I'm putting it on and we'll rotate it round and we'll just sort of park it over there. So very, very nice little library of uh, boats and things. There's also cars. Let's go and add a car into our scene. So over here into the garage area, let's swing around. One of the things you will need to learn with Twinmotion is the navigation. It can be a bit fiddly to begin with, um, but it's definitely something that's worth persisting with. So let's drag in a car. I think we'll have one car parked down the side here and perhaps we'll just have another car here. Let's change the color of that one. Um, so that we can actually kind of swing that round into our kind of garage area. You can see a bit tight at the moment, so perhaps that should be in the garage itself. Okay, so it's looking really good. Um, as I say, one of the benefits is you can either do your texturing in Twin Motion, or if you do want to, uh, you could do them in Vectorworks first. I actually like to do as much as I can in Vectorworks and then just bring that through into Twin Motion. Sometimes though, it's worth exploring sort of different materials. Uh, you know, you might want to sort of change the type of brick and sort of swap that out as well. Let's kind of keep it as it was as well. One other factor is if you click T for the texture tool, you can actually change the coloration locally. So I can just darken that brick down. And this is something that I will re definitely recommend to you. Um, the textures from Vectors can come through a little bit light as well. Okay, so it's looking really, really good. Um, if I do want to, as I say, I can just keep hopping back into Vectorworks, keep making a few changes. Uh, so for example, let's just add in another object here for my pavement. Now I'm being a bit careful here because I don't want to go to top plan necessarily uh, because that would basically change the link. Okay, so let's do this. So once again, just check on the data link. You do sometimes need to refresh this in order for it to do the updating. But that's only mainly if you've switched across to Twinmotion itself. So those changes are going across. So I think all we need just to finish off this little project for this demonstration is a couple of people. Um, and things like the animated people are really, really wonderful. We can just drag these in. We can change what they're doing and sort of poses and so on as well. And um, let's have someone for her to have a little interaction with. So those are the uh, animated people, which are nice. There's also some groups of people. So again, you can add those into your scene quite rapidly. Let's add some of those guys down there by the canal. And finally, if you do want to use the posed humans, these are particularly good for still images because they're much higher quality. So things like that in Twinmotion are very, very straightforward to do. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and basically create a couple of images in twin motion now at this stage. So I'm just going to kind of pan back a bit. Um, this is a little basic image, but let's click create. Now, when I've created my first image, I can basically go in and start to fine tune. So I can fine tune things like the location and things like the time of day. That looks nice with those shadows coming across. If you've modeled the building sort of physically accurately, then the shadows will be realistic. But if you have fake the north, you can actually just spin that north angle around, um, maybe just to create a sort of particularly nice visual. And of course, you can do sort of shadow studies in this way as well. So it's looking quite nice already. Um, I basically would like to create a few more images. So I'll just sort of whiz around to a few more points of view. And uh, let's kind of get over this side here. 
Now, of course, at the moment, you can see a background which is not the background we're looking for for this project by any means, certainly not Loughborough. So let's click onto More, go to Location, go to Background, and we will just swap that out. I normally go for either generic background or sometimes just a sort of generic countryside, and just sort of tune that round something a bit more neutral. Um, you get the idea, it looks quite nice. So basically, very quick, if I want to just set up a number of different views of my project, uh, very rapidly, I can do this. If we just need to change the weather, just to kind of make that look a little bit kind of more uh, rainy or a bit more kind of cloudy rather as well. So you will notice that the frame rate drops down a bit sometimes when you change the weather. So that's because I'm in the ultra settings at the moment. Uh, but what do you think? I think that looks really, really nice. Okay, so as you can see, we've done a bit more work on the model and I'm going to just review my images before we render these out. So basically, I'm just going to kind of swing through and one of the beauties of Twin Motion is this ability to very rapidly switch through the views and if you do want to just do a bit of tweaking on the lighting, let's just bring that lighting around. You can see absolutely lovely at night and the lights come on. If we go around to the front, we'll get the sun sort of streaming onto the building as well. So really, really nice the fact you can set each image with different lighting conditions. In fact, this one, I think I will actually go for a night shot. So let's just kind of take that down towards the evening, a sort of late sunset shot. Um, and that looks really, really nice. Okay, so once we've reviewed these images, I've just also set up a nice internal view as well, which is super easy to do. All we need to do is basically go to the Export tab and basically select those images that we would like to export. When we click Start Export, if we want to, let's just create a brand new folder for these. Let's call this Renders Final. And basically, you'll be amazed at the speed at which Twinmotion renders. One thing that's quite nice on the Mac is if you just pop open the Activity Monitor application, what you can do is go to both your CPU usage and also bring up the GPU usage as well. So just in here, as Twinmotion is rendering, you can see that the CPU rather is not doing that much, in fact, but the GPU, the graphics card, is doing all the heavy lifting. So if you do buy a computer specifically for Twinmotion, I really recommend getting probably the best GPU you can afford. I mean, I went for the M1 Pro chip, and that's been very good. The M1 Max would be a bit faster, but you know, it's uh, enough. So you can see that it's maxed out at the moment, and that'll be pretty much done in the next few seconds. Once you've actually completed the renderings, a really interesting thing to do is just pop into your statistics panel and click this one. And basically you can see here, let me just remove those, that the images were taking seven seconds to render. So that's pretty amazing. So what we'll do, we'll have a quick review of those images. Let's go to our folder over here, renders final, and let's just open these up in preview very quickly. And here we go, here's our final images. These are actually 4K. I decided to render them at 4K resolution. And you know, for a very, very quick turnaround within this webinar, hopefully you'll agree that this is sort of a nice little selection of images as a kind of starting point for my project. I mean, we can certainly do better renderings given a bit more time, but yeah, I'm really pleased with these so far. So now I can just pop back into Twinmotion and Vectorworks and just keep working on the two things together to refine them. So I hope you've enjoyed this part of this little presentation. Just gonna round off with showing you some final examples of a few other projects as well. But Twinmotion is an amazing bit of software and for Vectorworks users, it really works extremely well as a sort of direct link and direct connection. And I really hope you enjoy it. Now, I just wanted to take this opportunity to highlight my book, Revolutionize Your Rendering with Twinmotion. This is a beautiful 320 page, fully illustrated PDF and ebook that's available for you to buy in uh, on the store. And it features some of the best featured artists from all over the world. So if you want to learn more about Twinmotion, take a look at the book and I really hope you enjoy reading it. Anyway, let's get back to the videos and thanks for watching. Thank you, Tim. Hi Jonathan, thank you for that quick overview on some of the Twinmotion features. Um, I'm just seeing a few questions coming. I've seen that you've answered some in the chat box, but I'm just going to 
Yeah, sure. Miss Denny. Um, so I'm going to kind of group some of them because they're kind of related. So let's see. So yeah. twin, maybe it's good to give a background information about what twin motion is and how it's come about. Yeah, sure. OK, so the reason we focused on twin motion a little bit in this talk is two reasons, really. One, it's one of the major new features of Surface Pack 3, so I think that's valid to show. I mean, I'm just showing the vector with export is so quick and fast, you know, there's no point in showing that unless you show what twin motion is all about. Um, twin motion is a real-time rendering software made by Epic Games, so not, not to do with Vectorworks, it's a completely separate company. And if you've got kids, no doubt you would have heard of Fortnite, the uh, gaming company that they would all be playing, of course. Now, what's really interesting is the collision between gaming and architecture has been something we've talked about for years. And for me, there are a number of real-time rendering softwares, Twinmotion, there's Enscape, there's Lumium, and maybe a couple of others, D5 Render. But I really love Twinmotion. I've been using it since the beginning. And I'm really excited about the pace and speed of development that Epic Games are bringing to Twinmotion and the collaboration that they've had with Vectorworks. And um, just one final point. <laughs> For those of you who haven't yet got your free Twinmotion license, if you're on 2022, you need to grab it today, I think. You just need to log in to the customer portal and it should be waiting there as a free gift for you to claim the code and redeem it. Great, thank you. Um... Is there a way to use Twin Motion in an indoor theatre setting for set renders? You know what, Twin Motion is an amazing program and you can use it for absolutely anything. I've seen it used for architecture, for landscape, for interiors. I've even seen it used for product design and engineering uses. And absolutely, yes. Yeah. So as long as you have a three-dimensional model that you're modeling in CAD or BIM software, you can bring it into Twin Motion uh, no matter what the file format pretty much. Look, we've got this great connection with Vectorworks with the direct data link. Previously to that, I'm still, you know, been using the uh, Cinema 4D export from Vectorworks, which works very, very well as well. But if you're using other software, even, um, you'll be able to get it in in one form or another. So, yeah, as long as you can get a 3D model in, then you can apply lots of materials, textures, things like people moving around and so on. Uh, so, yeah, it's a really nice bit of software to work with your three-dimensional software. Okay, I think it's also good to just clarify if this is like a temporary license, a permanent license, um, and if it's transferable between mach machines. So, can you use it? Yeah, Windows well, Mac? good questions. Okay, so as far as I'm aware, um, the Twin Motion license you're getting for free from Vectorworks is a perpetual license. Now, I'm not sure what the long term upgrade policy will be. I think it's one year of upgrades, that's as far as I'm aware. After that, we'll see what the licensing model is. Um, but if it's free, that's a very generous offer to claim today. And many, I know many people who have. Everyone I've spoken to has, has got it already. So um, that's, that's definitely something. You can transfer it to different computers with ease. All you need to do is have an Epic account on different computers with the Epic launcher. You simply log in on one, it logs you out to the other one, and then you just go back again to computers. So I'm lucky enough to have a PC as well as a Mac. Um, and I'm, I do most of the work on my Mac because I love my new Mac, as, as you can gather from my passion. There are one feature, there's one feature that someone mentioned, the path tracing, which is ray tracing, which for some visuals can give you better quality. Um, and I use my PC for that. So I literally hop on the PC, render out the visuals and the back of the Mac for everything else. Um, it's a shame in a way that it's not there on the Mac yet, but I think it will come at some point. No idea where. But honestly, it's not a massive limitation because the downside of path tracing is the time taken is vastly uh, larger than the twin motion renders, which as you can see, come out in a number of seconds, really. Um, so yeah, we're kind of spoiled in, in terms of quality for the time taken, I'd say. And I think uh, just to wrap up this section, because um, we have other things to cover, how do we access the twin motion link in Vectorworks? I think people might have missed yeah. the palette that's located. Yeah, so actually traditionally it's on the visualization palette, which is the one with the light bulb down on the tool set. It's available in all Vectorworks versions, fundamentals and architect and so on. And um, you probably saw that I just edited my workspace, so it was up on my main basic tool sets as well. So yeah, straightforward there. You can actually also go to file export and do a data snip export from there. Okay, but that won't be 
if you like, a direct data link type of export. That will be a standalone data Smith export. And actually, the reason that's useful is because if you want to go, um, say, not to Twinmotion, but to Unreal Engine, okay, which people may have heard of, then you can export the data Smith directly to Unreal Engine as well. Okay. Unreal Engine is amazing, but the software, but it's, it's a whole new level from Twinmotion. It's, it's very deep, very complex, quite scary. You know, I, mean, I'm <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> I find it pretty scary at this stage. <laughs> and honestly, Twin Motion does so much, so well, so fast. Um, I think it's excellent software. I really, really enjoy using it. Okay, great. Okay, I think that's it for now. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Great. Okay, well, what we'll do, let's play on to the next video, um, which is basically going to be focused on the new Service Pack 3 Cloud Services improvements and Vectorx Nomad improvements. And then we'll come back for another little pause with some more questions before we launch the final presentation, which is going to be on more Vectorx Spotlight features from Kasim. Okay, let's go. So in this next video, we're going to talk about the new improvements to the Vectorworks Cloud Services for Vectorworks Service Pack 3. There's going to be some really nice improvements to performance because the Unity-based Nomad and WebView has now been improved dramatically. And this means that you can run really large files really, really smoothly, both on the desktop, but also on iOS devices. So we'll take a look at that. For those of you who use Google Drive, uh, there's a new integration with Google Drive and also Microsoft OneDrive. We also have Dropbox integration, but that was there before. And you will find that now with new regional storage improvements, i.e. local service to your geographical location, that the speed of upload and download from the service, cloud services, is vastly improved. And this should also make the uploads much more reliable as well. And finally, basically with Vectorwitz Nomad, we've also got Apple integration using the Apple Files app. And finally, we do have LiDAR point cloud support in the Nomad application as well. So what we'll do, let's go into take a look at some of these features and see how these can benefit your workflow using Service Pack 3 of Vectorworks 2022. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the new improvements in the Vectorworks Cloud Services in Vectorworks Service Pack 3. Now I'm going to use a real project that I did a little while ago for a new eco home that I got planning for this summer, which I was very pleased about. And you can see it's a really nice little project all developed using the BIM method of modeling in Vectorworks, where you can basically generate nice floor plans, but also your 3D model at the same time. You notice the project is just divided up in some simple layers and actually what this does is reference into the site file which is why there's no site context in this file but you will notice that I've got a number of drawings both sort of floor plans of different levels of detail and most importantly I've got things like some elevations. Now I'll just click update you'll see that these elevations are nicely rendered from my model and they'll take a few moments to do the updating. But what can happen is some of them can take a while, depending on the quality of the rendering, to do the updates. So what I'm going to do with these other ones, which aren't yet updated, as you can see, is we're going to go ahead and do the cloud publishing. So to access your cloud publish, you just go to the cloud menu and go to cloud publish. You can also access it directly from the file menu as well and the normal publish command there. But let's bring up the cloud publish option here. And you'll notice the first thing you can do is choose the required drawings to send across. Let's just do a selection of those, send them across for publishing. Of course, I do have all the usual PDF exports, things like naming and things like the quality settings. Um, let's go, let's just leave it on as it is on the highest quality. Okay, so you will notice the three options down here in this bottom left corner. We can process locally or we can store and process on the cloud. So when I click publish, it will basically say that the active document is not saved in its current state if I haven't saved it recently. So just click save now. That saves the document. This is now asking me if I'd like to record a set of drawings. If I do want to, I can call this client issue and give it a date. 
basically let's go ahead and put those drawings into this folder here and we'll just click publish. Now you notice it took very very little time to actually save the drawing and it's still open in the background here. But basically my vector its cloud services icon is now moving as you can see up on the top corner of the screen. So if I click onto the icon here this will basically open the status dialog and this is useful because I can now see that I've just done the publishing and basically that is syncing or uploading as we speak. So that's the first sort of stage um, and then once it's done that it will basically generate those PDFs automatically for me. So let's just come back in a few moments and have a look at those PDF files. That's almost done. As you can see I've got fairly good internet here at the office and that's pretty much done. So now it looks like it's moving on to the next stage and so on. So what we'll do, we'll come back in a second and we'll take a look at the resulting uh, PDFs that are being generated from the project. So here we can see the PDFs being processed and you can see the progress bar here is actually moving quite rapidly. If we click on the information, there's information about how long the job's going to be. Um, but it definitely won't be 23 hours, there's no way. It's going much, much faster than that. In fact, the good thing about the Vector it's Cloud is um, it's processing on very powerful servers so that it means that it can use you know, real computational power to crunch those renders. And this is basically offloading. It means that I can now carry on with my project um, happily working away in sort of real time, developing the designs, and every time I need to republish, I can just go to Cloud Publish once again. So it's a very effective way of offloading some of the um, sort of hard work of the publishing side and the rendering side. Okay, so let's go and review these PDFs. Um, basically, I'm just going to pop open to uh, my Cloud icon, and we can review these on the desktop. Let's move it across here. And you'll notice that I've got my PDFs that were generated directly on the cloud and not on my computer. I'm just going to check and they all look fantastic. Uh, they'll be exactly the same as if you generated them on the desktop. But the real beauty is all these renderings were done um, on the cloud and not using my computer. So it meant that I was free to get on with some other work instead at the same time. So I really, really recommend using the cloud to um, speed up your workflow and use intelligently as and when you're under dead pressure from deadlines to kind of help with those sort of uh, big renders particularly. You know, things like 2D drawings don't matter. When you come onto the renderings, um, especially when you get onto final quality or redshift renders, it definitely takes a bit more time to render those. So the cloud is there for you. It's a very nice improvement. One other really nice benefit of the cloud services is that we can basically render up using redshift even if we don't have Redshift supported on our particular computers. Now, I'm lucky enough to have the Mac M1 processor. Um, you can see I've just got the nice laptop with the base model, and it works really well for Redshift. So if I do want to, I can just go down to my Redshift rendering, choose, let's go for um, Redshift Interior Fast. And if I click Update, you'll notice it will kind of render up reasonably quickly. But if you don't have a graphics card that can support the Redshift rendering, then you won't be able to do this. The good thing though, with um, the new cloud services, it will actually support Redshift for you. So you're welcome to use that, even if your computer doesn't actually support it. Now you can see this was just a fast render and it's gone pretty quickly. You can see a few artifacts and so on as well, but the lighting looks good and the general sort of level of quality of the rendering is pretty nice. So I definitely recommend looking at the Redshift rendering. It's much faster and much improved. But now with the fact that we can actually render that up on the cloud, let's just go ahead and render that one image. Uh, so we'll just do that one internal view. Just check we've got store and publish on the cloud. Click publish. Of course, you do need to just save the document one more time, just so it has the latest update on the um, cloud, if you like. And I don't need to save a set. Let's go ahead and open that folder. Okay, so the Vectorwitz Cloud has now completed the Redshift rendering and it looks really nice and it took no time at all on my desktop publishing. Excellent. Now for you also, if we go into the settings, just while that's rendering, I just want to highlight a couple of extra settings in here. Um, so you've got some nice little kind of preferences that you can do here where you can actually kind of keep things synced and backed up as well. You can also use uh, Vectorwitz project files by the look of things too. So that's cool. You can change your cloud services folder if needed. 
If you go to integrations, this is where you'll see some of the new integrations that have been added with Service Pack 3. Uh, we've had Dropbox for a while, but you've now got Google Drive, OneDrive, and also Bluebeam is there too. There's some other options in here that you can have a look at. We'll just go back and have a quick look at any other settings here. If you do need to get a tour, just click onto the tour button, and this will basically take you through all the really kind of good access and information about the cloud itself. So very, very nice indeed. So I just want to highlight a few extra things that we can do with the cloud. So as well as looking at the progress and status and actually the cloud services folder, we can actually launch the application on the browser. Now I'm using Google Chrome at the moment. Obviously you can set whichever browser you would like. But you'll notice here we are live on the cloud and I'm logged in and basically all the files that I see both on my desktop are here as well. Um, there's a couple of extra settings I just want to draw your attention to. If we go to your preferences for a second, uh, this is where you can actually change the region. So if I did want to, I could actually change the region to Europe, and that would actually give me better performance. So I think after this webinar, I will do that. Just click that and apply. Let's leave that for now. You can also generate the quality settings for your PDFs as well, uh, from low to very high, so that's useful. And finally, you can also do things like font substitutions if needed. So if you do find fonts missing or anything like this, you can kind of sort this out uh, directly in the cloud services as well. The final thing is you can manage the notifications you receive. Now, all of this is very useful just to tell you if jobs are failing or when jobs are completed as well. So definitely take a look at the uh, services there. So let's go back to our home folder. Now, if I wanted to, at any time, I could right-click on a file and I could do a number of things. So not only could I download it um, to kind of put it onto a different computer, I could actually share it with someone else or I could just share the link to the file. But you'll notice that I can also generate PDFs directly as well as doing it from my uh, Vetwitz application. I can actually generate those PDFs directly from here if needed. But the thing I really want to show you at this stage is how we can generate a 3D model. Okay, so we, this is how we can actually generate a VGX file of our project. You can see that the job has now been submitted. And just give me a second while that updates. Let's just have a quick look at the progress. There we go. You can see it's now generating uh, one of my renders here, but it's also generating the VGX file as we speak. So in a moment, we'll be able to open that up and actually come and view it as well. So you can see it's pretty quick to generate. Um, it doesn't take too long at all. So here is my VGX file, for example. Let's right click and click view to open up that file. You'll notice it takes a few moments to download into the viewer. And then once it's in there, we'll be able to navigate around our file and have a look at our project in a viewer that basically is available to absolutely everybody. Now, there's some really nice improvements in the new viewer. It's now based on the Unity uh, application, which, uh, as you know, is a sort of big gaming company who do lots of real-time sort of rendering and so on. So I just want to demonstrate some of the features here. So the first one is if you click onto the Home button, that basically just takes you home in case you get lost. The second thing is you left-click to position your sort of point of rotation. So now you can rotate around a, a more convenient point in the model. Obviously, you can use the mouse to wheel in and wheel out. And if you're ready to kind of do a bit of walking around, you can click onto the footsteps. And this means that we can now navigate in around using the keys on the keyboard. Okay, so this is going to be the traditional WASDA keys. Now, anytime, if you right click, you can actually teleport as well. So I can right click and teleport to different areas of my project and kind of explore those as I would like. Let's go back into just panning around. There we go. So we get a nice view here. So that's all really, really good. We can kind of navigate around our project and we can kind of teleport to certain areas as well. I think we could probably teleport inside if needed. Uh, let's just kind of go down there and let's teleport back to this location. So let's just kind of go outside and let's just have a look at these shadows. So if I kind of swing the light round, now you can really kind of understand the shadows on the project. Uh, let's just spin around the view, let's go there, kind of come back a bit more. Sometimes it can be, uh, I will tell you, it's a little bit fiddly to control. Um, so yeah, you definitely need your driving license, as it were, to control this. But now you can see it's really nice. 
I could essentially do a sort of real-time simulation of the light if I'd orientated my rod all correctly as well. And basically I can turn those shadows on and off. I can also um, change the quality of the shadows if I want to bring them up to high level. Just swing that light round again. You can see they're nice and crisp now. So it looks really good. Okay, so what we'll do, let's just pop back to home. And I want to show you another function which is really nice, the clip cube. So now basically we have a clip cued function. And look at that, it looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, basically we've got our clip cube. Enable that or disable it at any time just by clicking on the icon and basically turning it off and turning it back on again. So now I'm back into kind of orbit mode. I can kind of orbit around my project. Let's turn off the footsteps and just orbit round. And you can get a really good impression of the floor plan. Now the biggest benefit of this is not necessarily for you or I who got Vectorworks, but for your client um, or your team of collaborators who may not have a copy of Vectorworks available, but they still might want to kind of get involved in the project and actually kind of comment on, um, you know, understanding the space and so on. So what do you think of those new improvements? I'm really impressed by not only the speed, uh, the fact that you can kind of navigate around really, really smoothly, but also I really like the new sort of shadows that you can kind of improve and turn on as well. And actually makes a big, big difference for things like floor plans, just to kind of get that readability. Now there are a few other settings in here if needed, things like the speed, the projections as well. You'll notice you can actually go into orthogonal mode as well. Which is really cool. So in orthogonal mode, um, it looks kind of nice. Excellent. So this is the viewer. Um, let's just turn off our clip cube and click home to get back out. So if you do get lost, you click on the home button and that will basically take you back to where you were at the beginning of the project. So the new viewer, this is VGX, uh, VGX file. And I will show you in a minute how we can view this on an iPad, on an iPhone for a different project as well. But I hope you've enjoyed this sort of vector its cloud services demo for this particular project. So Vectorwix Nomad has been around for a number of years now, but with Surface Pack 3, there's some really big improvements, including the integration of the Unity engine under the hood. So let's take a look at this on my iPad and my iPhone. This is very exciting. It's something that we can share with anybody all over the world using pretty much any device. Let's just hop into this demonstration. So just before we have a look at the Nomad Viewer on my iPad in a moment, I wanted to show you how it works on an iPhone. So I've got an iPhone 13 and I can view this file in 3D. Now you'll be astounded at the performance that you're getting. Um, you can see here's the first project I was looking at for the Twin Motion demo and it's really, really responsive. Now it's a bit harder to navigate around on the phone, definitely um, a little bit easier on the iPad, but you can see it's very responsive and very smooth. And we actually have all of the same functions we have on the iPad, just on a smaller screen. So the interface, as I say, is a little bit different to allow for the smaller screen size, but you can see it's perfectly capable of doing things like cutting sections and so on. So you can imagine if you're out on site and you needed to show something to the contractor while you're out on site, this would be extremely convenient um, because you, know, you could get the office to email over the file, you could generate a VGX, and then you could basically sit with the contractor and show him exactly what you wanted to communicate. Also really useful for clients as well. Um, so all of the functionality is there, both on the phone and the iPad. As I say, the only real difference is the interface is a little bit more spacious on the iPad side of things. But in terms of navigating around, you can see it's very smooth. I really like the new fidelity of the image with the new shadows, and I love the new clip cube. I think that's an absolute uh, brilliant feature that I'll definitely be making use of a lot more. It's pretty self-explanatory to learn how to use the app, and I definitely recommend you ask your clients to start to look at. Now, if you do want to, you can go into the layer control and this project you can see I can easily just turn off the roof. So that means we can peer into the first floor and get a really good understanding of how that sort of space works inside the project. So definitely something that's fun to do. As I say, let's have a look at it on the iPad now. So just before we move on to the next project, I want to show you one more mode, which is the AR or augmented reality mode that you can also use on the iPad. So it's just a quick example where you can basically place your model onto a surface. Uh, we can zoom in a bit here, as you can see, 
And then basically it's really nice we can walk around and explore the project almost uh, as if it was in sort of uh, augmented reality. I mean, obviously this isn't the right context or site for this project at all, but it's just really a quick example of how you might be able to uh, explore the design. Now, one thing you want to do is try and sort of, you know, place it in the natural environment if you can, if that's at all feasible. But you notice it really is quite responsive. I like the way you've got these lovely shadows as well. So it looks quite realistic and the textures have come across extremely nicely. You can zoom in and zoom out with a pinch of the finger. And if you do want to, you can kind of revolve the model around. But otherwise, if you just walk around, the model stays where it is. And as you can see, the background will change and you get basically the view of the project potentially in its context. Um, let's just explore around to the front of the project here, to this building here. So you can see the garage and then the front here. Now, if you go down to sort of eye level um, and then kind of move forward, you should be able to kind of get inside the building in a second. We'll do that. Let's just go around for a full sort of 360 degrees. One thing you're going to want to do here is um, try and keep the iPad nice and stable. And here we go. Here we can see I'm basically kind of walking into the space. Let's go down a bit. And I think this is pretty cool in that you can actually see the view out the windows potentially of your project in its context. And you can kind of explore around the design and it's fun to do, definitely. I so say the navigation with these things always a bit tricky, so definitely something that needs a little bit of practice. I think the augmented reality mode is a nice additional benefit. Um, it's definitely something that you can try for certain projects. Let's just get down to that eye level again, sort of get a bit of an impression of how it might look to be sort of looking into that balcony area. As you can see, you can pop the settings open and we can adjust things like the lighting and turn the shadows on and off as well. So all the controls uh, that you're gonna see in the other application are there. And I really like the fact you can kind of have layer control. So as the model was developed in these simple layers, I can go around and look at it without the roof on and get a really good impression of how that kind of space works up on that first floor. So, you know, you've got all the controls that you would expect in a sort of navigation program but this sort of augmented reality mode is something that's definitely been dramatically enhanced by the new Unity engine in the viewer. As I say, the only thing is just to kind of practice the sort of navigation a little bit more. But what do you think? I think that's really nice and potentially very useful in certain projects in certain contexts. So it's definitely something I would recommend you have a little play with and I'll look forward to showing you another project in a moment on my iPad and this is going to be for a very very large project unlike this one which is just a, a small house um, and you'll see how the Unity apps with going to cope with a very very large project next. So here I am on the Vectorwix Nomad app on my iPad and just before we have a look at another project I just wanted to show you how easy it is to view PDFs as well. So you can see you're just downloading really quickly and those PDFs that we generated in the previous sort of uh, demonstration for this Eco Home project are available. So again, easy for you to share your drawings now with your clients and very convenient um, as opposed to them having to print drawings off or, you know, maybe sit around the computer. They can actually just view those at home uh, at the comfort with their iPad or phone. Okay, so what we're going to now do is just go back and look at another project. And this is a really interesting project that I did a number of years ago, and it's called Wood Wharf. Basically, it was a big master plan project for uh, the next stage of Canary Wharf development, and it was all modelled in Vectorworks. I have to tell you, it was done in about 2006, so it's nice to revisit this project. But the reason I'm showing you this is because this is probably the largest or most complicated 3D project I've done um, in an old version of Vectorworks, and even now, it works extremely well. So you can see here I am navigating around in Vectorworks Nomad in the walk mode. You can see I can just navigate around really nicely. And basically it's very responsive. This is giving us a huge improvement in performance using the Unity-based viewer. 
and you can see I'm able to cut sections even through what is a very large model, um, quite complex in lots of ways, there's lots of geometry here, um, and it's a really, really big project that I just really wanted to demonstrate the power of the new viewer on. So using things like sections, um, I can navigate around and I can still play around with things like the view, lighting. If I click this button on the side, you can see I can turn the clip cube on and off with a click. While you're navigating around, you can click on the home button to just reset the view at any time. And that does help sometimes if you get a bit lost when you're navigating around. Now, here we go, you can see I'm demonstrating the lighting direction and also things like the shadows as well in this new view and it works extremely quickly and rapidly. So let me show you how easy it is to share the file. All we need to do is click share. You can see who you've currently shared with, um, with me appearing there already, of course. And basically I can just type in the email or I can just copy and paste, which is a bit easier. So info at jonathanreeves-cad.co.uk. I can give the approvals, click okay. And now you can see that I've shared with that particular person, which is excellent. If I do want to, I can click back on the home button and click who I have shared with. Um, so you can see all the things that have been shared with you and that you have shared as well. So very, very nice way to share your projects and your files with other users and collaborators. So I really hope you've enjoyed learning about the Vectorids Cloud Services and the numerous improvements to that and also the Nomad application. So just to finish off, I thought I'd let you know that there's a tutorial on this particular Woodworth uh, Master Plan project. And you can see here's some nice material that I prepared for the Twin Motion Challenge a couple of years ago using my Vectorwitz model and taking it off into Twin Motion. So I thought this would be a nice way to end off. And thanks for watching, and I look forward to hearing from you with any comments or questions. Oh, that was very useful. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Katine. Yes, I mean, you know, Vectorworks Nomad's been around for a few years now, and the cloud service as well. Um, yeah. My experience is that not many of our users are making the most of it. Um, maybe that's because it wasn't fully featured or they just didn't know about it, probably, maybe awareness. I think this is a really good time to now have a look at it and explore because the, you know, the feature set is there. And with the new Unity engine I kept talking about, the, the graphics power is there to handle even huge projects like that Woodworth one. It was really nice to revisit that project after, gosh, I said it was done in 2006. In, you know, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Eight or something like that, you know. Um, so even, even then, Vectorworks was very capable in 3D, but now we've got the viewer to look at it as well. No, I agree. I've also tested out the Vectorworks Remote app as well. So do check out the whole Cloud yeah. Services app because there's other resources on there that could be very useful. Um, yeah. Definitely. It's a great way to share with your clients because it means that they can access it from whatever device they have and at the convenience of uh, printing it off without printing it off at home, you know, just on their device. It's much more interactive for 3D stuff, of course, and, and just PDF as well. No, I agree. Uh, I have a little secret. <laughs> I recently got a new iPhone for the ability to do like point clouds. Oh, so right. I know my app as well. So, yeah, have a look. Yes, that's right. The, the, the LiDAR, the point the LiDAR is, is yeah. on iPhone. I've not yet tried that, but look forward to, to having a go. Yeah. It's one of the new features. We didn't demonstrate it today, but um, I think there is going to be some content coming out on that shortly. No, of course. Um, there's a general question about whether this works with geo-referencing uh, or being able to locate in a real place like Google Earth, maybe. Um, I'm not sure if, if it has a capability as yet, um, but it's something maybe they're working on in the future. I'm not sure. Do you? Yeah, um, I don't believe so. I could be stand corrected, but um, I'm not aware that that feature is there as yet. Um, but don't forget that actually Vectorworks as an app does have geolocational uh, facilities. Yes. So it, it could well be that if you import the geolocation in Vectorworks before you export the VGX, then of course it will you know, have the context around it, perhaps some Google context or something. So I think it's something you would need to do in Vectorworks using the geolocation tools in the software. And then when you export, um, it should export that context as well. No, I agree. Um, 
just information about how to use the cloud, you can check out the university website to learn cloud services, or there are some tutorials or guides on the VectorX cloud website itself. Um, it's up in the help menu as well. When you're in VectorX, yeah. you can just launch the cloud website, or you can launch the, um, the cloud folder, essentially. So as soon as you're logged into VectorX, which I think everybody has to now on the later versions, then you have cloud services available. So it's very easy to use. I will post the link in the chat because a few of you have asked for the cloud services um, apps and things like that. So I'll, I'll post a link in the chat shortly. Um, one slightly different question. <laughs> uh, sure. Basically, someone's asked about Unified View. It's disappeared in VectorX 2022, and they're wondering if there's a way to get that back. There is actually, yeah. So um, the Unified View, um, this is the screen plane, layer plane, and, uh, and, you know, kind of automatic plane, is a question that I get asked all the time when I'm doing VectorX training and teaching. So, you know, Unified View has now been depreciated, which is a kind way of saying it's sort of been, uh, been hidden away, okay? It is still there um, to support legacy projects for whatever reason. So, in a way, what that means is if you start a new project, you kind of don't really have the screenplay in that search, okay? If you do need to find it, just right-click into the document and go to Document Preferences, and you'll see it there under the uh, Legacy section. You can actually return it back on if there's a reason why you needed it, okay? But going forward, Vectorus have depreciated it so that we don't have the screen plane anymore. We just have layer plane and automatic plane and working planes. Agreed, okay? yeah. <laughs> it did confuse people before, so hopefully the picture won't be there. So it's um, like you can put it back on. Okay. So this webinar is recorded, so you'll be able to uh, watch it after the session ends. Um, but perhaps we should move on to the last video or the last section in this webinar. Yeah, I think so. We were going to do a quick poll. Um, should we do oh, that? Do we now? have a poll ready? Yeah. Should we do that yet? Have you got yeah. a poll? We'll do a quick poll, and then we'll get into the last video and then final questions. How do we do that? Are you, is that for me to launch or? Let me. See. Oh, here we go. Oh, looks yeah, like I can do it. Right. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to launch my poll. So, there we go. Here's our first poll. So, if you wouldn't mind responding, that would be really appreciated. Okay. Oh, yeah. Looks like we're getting 60% uh, voted, 65. So, we'll give it a few more seconds. If you're still awake, hopefully you can still vote. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, good. Right, I think I'm going to close the poll now, about 80% uh, that's shown the results. So, yeah, very good. Look at that. That's really good. So, 82% of you said you are using 2022. It's a good result. Um, about 18% are not yet. Um, hopefully, you've been inspired to consider it in the future at some point as well. That's excellent. Okay, good. So we'll hide those results. Um, we've got one more question for you, if you don't mind. One more little poll on twin motion. It'd be really interesting this one to see who's using it. Wow. Okay. Interesting results coming in. Okay. We're nearly there at 80% of who voted. So we'll close that shortly. Yeah, I think that's just about it. We'll close that poll. So let's share those results. Oh wow, okay. <laughs> That's not bad, actually. That's yeah. more than I thought. So we've got a third of people using it already, which is fantastic. Um, but also two-thirds of people not yet using it, and it's very exciting for them to, to start on their journey uh, with Twinmotion. Definitely. Excellent. Okay, good. I'll hide those results. And let's, without further ado, we'll get into the final video uh, with a little introduction from Kasim. So this video is just basically covering some of the new updates for the entertainment industry um, and some of the overall features from 2022. Thanks, Katine. We'll see you in a minute. With the release of VectorX 2022, there was a lot of development that went into the next-gen technology. With the VectorX being the first BIM application to run natively on Apple Silicon, the use of Metal on Mac and DirectX on Windows. 
In Service Pack 3, there's also been another core change with the use of GLTF, GLB when exporting MVR to Vision. GLTF, which stands for GL Transmission File, is basically another 3D file format, which has replaced the 3DS format. The new file format uses the most up-to-date technology, making it easier for wider collaboration in the industry and project information exchange. The main change you'll see in Service Pack 3 is a new check button for export in 3DS. So if you go to the file menu, export, export MVR, in this dialog box you'll see the new 3DS file format so you can continue as previous version, otherwise you can just click OK and save your MVR file. You can then take this MVR file into Vision or any other suitable applications. With the release of 2022, there's been a few other additional updates to increase productivity, such as more context menus for selecting lighting devices by instrument type. We can make quick changes to any of the fields or select lighting devices by position, making it easier to just pick up information on that specific truss um, devices. There's also been additional ad updates to the find and modify menu allowing you to set criteria of your most regular commands. You can also action those criteria and manage the sets. By choosing what you want to search for and adjust, checking out the fields correct, so for example moving light on the design layer in this one, we can then modify by deleting, changing classes or any of the other actions listed. So I'm just going to create this set, so I'm going to name it Moving Light, New Class, because this will now be one of my regular set that I'll be using moving forward. And I'm just going to click OK. Notice that I haven't clicked Applied, so when I go to Devices, they're on the class None. So now if I go back to find the Modify menu, and I select it from my, my drop-down menu, Moving Class New, Moving Light New Class, and select the class I want to move the Moving Light to, I will then click apply for it to take effect. I could then make an adjustment to any other field or commands or criteria that I need um, and click OK. Now going back to check on those moving lights, you can see that they're moved to the correct classes. Again, these little commands will just increase your productivity as you're working. I'll now show a short video um, on one of the biggest adjustments for the entertainment industry, which is the cable tool. Welcome to the Cable Tools Suite skill videos. Cable planning is a vital part of any production, no matter what size or type. Ever since the original cable tools were added to Spotlight, we've been gathering feedback from you about pain points and what you needed to be added to support your cable planning processes. The new Cable Tools Suite has been developed as a result of this feedback. The new tools take advantage of all the latest Vectorworks technology like styles and data tags, have significantly improved performance, and use an efficient 2D, 3D hybrid workflow. To achieve all of this, the entire toolset was re-engineered from scratch and a range of new features, tools, and concepts have been added to Spotlight. In this, the first of the Cable Tool skill videos, you'll go over the differences between the old and the new tools. You'll learn a bit about the supporting concepts and features behind the new tools. Each of the new tools and supporting features will be covered in much more detail later in the video series. The first thing you will notice when comparing the new cable tool suite with the old is that instead of individual specialized insertion tools for the different cable types, there is now a single cable tool that can insert any type of cable. The new cable tool has been designed to streamline the process of drawing cables. You no longer have to configure the tool preferences to set up each type of cable you want to draw. Now simply select the cable style and start drawing. For example, you would have a style for Socapex cables and another for XLR microphone cables. Other changes include the addition of auto numbering and the consolidation of several of the old cable planning menu commands into the tool as modes, all of which will help speed up your cable drawing workflow. In addition to the re-engineered cable tool itself, there are three completely new tools in the cable planning suite. The first is the cable path tool. It is common when planning event cable systems that many of your cable runs will share the same route for at least part of their length. For example, from the Dimmer City to the cable truss. This tool creates cable path objects that are used as insertion guides to speed up the drawing process and reduce the need to duplicate cable objects. The second is the distributor tool. 
which is used to place your power and signal distributor objects, like multi-core breakouts, audio amplifiers, and DMX splitters. The third is the cable area tool, which is used to assign cable tool insertion preferences to specific areas of your design. For example, you may want to use a different amount of spare cable when planning lighting power cables than from when you're planning audio speaker cables. To get the most out of the cable tool suite, there are a number of concepts and terms that need to be understood. Along with a couple of features like styles and data tags that you may not be familiar with yet. The first of the new concepts that the tool introduces is that of the distributor and consumer objects. For our purposes, a distributor object is anything that can split a power or data signal. Good examples include moving light distros, DMX splitters, and multi-core breakouts. Previously, break-ins and break-outs were part of multi-core cables. Now they are a separate object with their own symbols and attached data. A consumer is any object that requires power and or signal to function, such as a moving light, a rigging hoist, or an audio speaker. The new cable tool suite is designed to be used in both 2D and 3D drafting workflows. Cable runs drawn in 2D will automatically document height changes when they are connected to trusses and pipes with a trim height, automatically creating a 3D cable object. And combined with the easy to use 2 and 3D editing options, removes the need to manually enter height changes in the cable object properties to compensate for the 3D route a cable run has to follow. This provides a fast and easy to use drafting workflow no matter whether you prefer to draw in 2D or 3D. One of the key focuses of the new cable tool suite is to make the cable planning workflow as efficient as possible by reducing the number of mouse clicks required to insert a cable, making them easier to edit, and improving the performance of the cable objects themselves. The new tools are designed to aid your workflow and make it useful for planning any type of event, show, or production cabling system of any size. The cable preferences are settings that control how the cable tool calculates the length of a cable run and what cable parts are used to create it. To better support the new cable tool suite, these preferences have been reworked, and you are no longer limited to a single set of cable preferences in a file. In Spotlight terminology, connectors are the plugs and sockets used on cables and other objects that interact with them. To support the wide and constantly changing variety of connector types that are used in the entertainment industry, the list of available connectors for the cable tool suite is easily edited and customized. Cable parts are the individual cables used to create a cable run, and each represents a physical cable of a standard length. For example, a 10 meter socket pex or a five foot microphone cable. Each part documents a variety of important data about the cable, and you can easily edit or create new parts to better represent what is available to you locally. Object styles are a type of resource that defines some or all of the parts of an object. The cable tool uses styles to define the type of cable object being created, including its classing, graphical elements, cable connectors, and other parameters that previously have to be set manually in the tool preferences. Data tags are an annotation and labeling system that can be set to display specific data from a linked object based on the data that object has attached to it. The cable tools use data tags to display important information about the cables, distributors, and cable paths. Another of the key objectives of the new cable tool suite was to make them fully Braceworks compatible. Cable objects now apply accurate loads to the trusses and pipes that they are associated with. If you have any additional questions to the cable tool, I would suggest having a look at the Vectorworks University. Um, as the training team has created the very in-depth cable tool suite training guide. Um, I will now post the link in the GoToWebinar chat. Hey Cassie, that was, that was interesting. I don't know anything about that uh, <laughs> yeah. highly specified industry, but it looks amazing. It's just small little updates to like increase productivity and workflow. And this year we really focused on like stability and just getting the, the major technology sorted before we do anything um, massive. But I think the cable tool is more than enough. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, look, I'm an architect, so that's what I focus on architecture and landscape. But, you know, Spotlight to me looks like an amazing product. I played with it a bit and um, the things it can do are phenomenal really within that industry. It's uh, becoming extremely widely used and very popular, I'm very aware of. No, oh, of course. 
Um, I'm just double checking if there's any other questions as we are pretty much over our time. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's just gone by really quickly. Um, but if you have any new questions, please place them in the question chat. Um, but I don't see anything um, new at the moment. Well, listen, I think as Kasim says, we've you know, been really nice to have a really good number of people coming. Um, and thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. It's been good fun to make and good fun to prepare for. Thanks, Kasim. No, thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> thank you. Right. Excellent. So, well, I guess people are dropping off and we'll say goodbye to everybody. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. But please do reach out if there's anything we can do to help either to Kasim or myself, and uh, we'll be glad to help. Okay, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Sorry, I keep getting distracted by the question box. <laughs> but no, yeah, thank you all for right. your nice comments. Thank you, and goodbye to everybody else, and thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you, goodbye. Bye-bye.